Hi, my name is Jerry Bartles and I'm a Civil Technical Specialist with Autodesk. I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation where we will discuss the new features in AutoCAD Civil 3D 2013. Now having said this, when it comes to new features, I have to remember that Civil 3D is built on top of both MAP uh, 2013 as well as AutoCAD 2013 and there are a number of new features included in those applications as well. Today's presentation will focus primarily on those things in Civil 3D 2013. We may touch on a couple of those that relate to AutoCAD and MAP, but for the most part we will discuss things that fall into three primary categories, those being survey, transportation, and pressure networks. Now when it comes to survey, the first area that we'll uh, explore will be the new survey querying functionality. What that will allow us to do is we can go into a survey database that may have thousands of points and thousands of lines or, or what would be called survey figures in Civil 3D and it gives us the ability to query them. So instead of having one large database of, of points and, and lines, we now have the ability that we can go in and query and say find all of the curbs or find all of the points that are uh, lot corners or something to that effect. It, it basically allows us to use our survey data more effectively and, and more efficiently. In addition, there have been some other improvements to the survey functionality in that we can now label or apply annotation to the survey figures consistent with what we would typically do with parcels. Uh, as well as with the querying functionality, we'll leverage some of that with our surfaces so we can have a little bit more of a dynamic relationship between the data that's in our survey, survey database and the surface that's maybe created as a result of that information. Now in the world of transportation, we're going to look at a couple of different things. First, there have been some general improvements to what we have already uh, as it relates to creating corridors have, have now been more streamlined. We've got some tools building surfaces that would work with the, the corridor models for uh, cleaning up the outside edges. Maybe we don't need as many um, like outer boundary type of uh, uh, operations to build those surfaces. Some extensions that we've had in the past have been rolled now directly into the application, those being as an example the volumes dashboard. So computing earthwork is now uh, more efficient uh, and gives us some more functionality than we had, even the ability to report. So as we get into the demonstration portion, we'll take a look at those uh, features and functionality. Now, in addition, when it comes to corridor modeling, Civil 3D ships with a large amount of content. In the event that you need to create some new content, maybe to represent a retaining wall or um, a special type of curb or, or other type of uh, structure that's going to be part of your, your corridor model, we now ship as one of those uh, former extension tools that now ships with Civil 3D 2013 is what's called a subassembly composer. So if you've had custom uh, areas of your corridor model to represent various things like in this example a retaining wall, in the past we would have either had to have written code or create a polyline to represent those features. We can now through the subassembly composer easily create not only the representation of the object but also have the object include some parameters that perhaps we can control the retaining wall height or width or something about the base based on our our design or the the uh, makeup of our model and as an example we can see that in this case here's where the retaining wall is being used and we can see that the retaining wall is adjusting its height um, consistent with interacting with the the ground surface now in addition to the corridor uh, improvements as it relates to transportation we now also support railway design so in the past uh, we were limited on alignments that it had to be core, uh, curve based for our, uh, our alignment geometry it can now be cord based which is consistent with railway design the other thing that we can do is we can now support cant which is kind of the super elevation equivalent for railway so where our competition would say that we uh, can't do cant we now can do cant and we'll go through and, and we'll take a look at some of the parameters and see how that's applied when we get to the demonstration portion. Finally, the last large bucket that we're going to look at is pressure networks or pressure pipe. It is uh, something that folks have been looking for, primarily in pipes in Civil 3D. We'd be working with gravity for storm or sanitary. We now have a, a uh, purpose-built set of tools specific for pressure pipes for the uh, layout, both in plan and profile, as well as the annotation. Uh, that it will include pipes, it will include uh, appurtenances like valves or fittings like T's, bends, elbows, things like that. When the uh, information goes in, it is uh, intelligent in its design in that as you start to put it in, there's a compass represented in the graphic here that if there are specific bends that uh, are available as part of your 
parts list, it will utilize those bends during the layout. We can do design checks. All right, it really helps us facilitate the design and creation of pressure networks. All right, finally, uh, as with uh, gravity, we can go through and we can apply uh, labels and annotation to control the, uh, the documentation, uh, how that's displayed on the screen, as well as it is consistent with prior pipe tools within Civil 3D. We have styles to represent how those will be displayed on the screen. So let's flip over into Civil 3D and we'll start to take a look at some of these features here. So I'm in Civil 3D 2013. A couple things you may notice that it's a little bit different is my command line at the bottom. As we start to work, you'll see that the command line has been proved. It's a, something that's been changed on the AutoCAD side. So because we're AutoCAD based, we get the advantage of that. But uh, the command line is now, you know, we can undock it. What it'll do is you'll see as we work, it will display information in the command line and then it'll kind of fade away. So it, it gives us the ability to, instead of having to dedicate six or five or eight lines of screen at the bottom for uh, information of what, what's going on in the application, it can now display as many as 40 lines. It'll roll up in a transparent type of display on the screen and then kind of fade away. So that's one thing I'd like you to kind of keep track of with the uh, command line improvements. A couple other things, we'll see some new pull downs at the top. There is a uh, survey pull down. So our purpose built tools for survey are now available to us in a um, ribbon that now make it a little bit easier. We're not uh, required to go strictly through the tool space to get access to the survey functionality. So we'll go through and we'll address some of these tools here in a few minutes. A couple other things I'd like you to see. If we insert, you'll see that there are tools to import IMX files. That would be infrastructure modeler. So our interaction between some of the other packages that Autodesk supports are those that would be included in the suite. We can take data from infrastructure modeler. We can move it into civil 3D. At the same time, there are also tools in the output that we can export data from Civil 3D to take back into Infrastructure Modeler. So there are some tools that allow us to do that. A couple other things we'll take a look at is plugins. Plugins, there is a apps function that is available in Civil 3D. And with this apps function, much like the Apple Store, we can go out and we can acquire uh, applications that can run directly within our software. If we come up to the top here and we'll select the exchange area in Civil 3D. I'm connected to the internet so we should bring up a site where we can select some of these apps. In my case I've, I've already grabbed one of them. Uh, we see some of the tools that are in here we can search and, and see some others. I will leave you to uh, uh, do that perhaps as some homework to experiment with some of the, uh, the tools that are available. Uh, the one that I've already downloaded and installed just by selecting off that um, app store is the uh, tool that allows us to convert Google SketchUp files such that they can be used in Civil 3D and then maybe exported to be used in 3ds Max Design or in Infrastructure Modeler or some of our Navisworks or another application. So for example, if our requirements for our project was that we were going to uh, need a cement, uh, cement truck or an office building or a gas station or something like that, through this tool we can come out and we can grab data directly from the Google warehouse and leverage that data within our software. So we're going to grab a cement truck here. We'll go ahead and search. We'll just download the uh, the first one that comes in. In many cases you'll have multiple ones to select from. We'll place that in our file and if I change my display we'll see that we've got a uh, cement truck now available and if we switch to a realistic display it will be uh, rendered error of materials on it consistent with what's in uh, the warehouse. So very nice tool, gives us access to a whole wealth of content uh, for our model for display purposes or visualization and then once again it provides a convenient uh, way for us to share data between some of the other applications we may want to use. All right now speaking of uh, from a Google perspective one thing that you will notice as you get into 2013 is there is not the push and pull back and forth to Google Earth. Currently that uh, tool is not supported in Civil 3D 2013. Uh, Autodesk um, understands the importance of a tool to be able to bring in aerial photography for imagery and also surface data. However, uh, we're going to be exploring some other options in the future and, and maybe some better ways to do that. And I, I would uh, um, have you keep an eye on the discussion forums and blogs and uh, the Civil 3D Facebook page and uh, especially Autodesk Labs to get an idea of some, maybe some things we're taking a look at 
and uh, how we will address those in the future. So as we have more information on how that uh, functionality will be addressed, we'll, uh, we'll be sharing it through those channels. So now that being said, we have other uh, folks at uh, Autodesk per perhaps that have uh, blogs that share tools they've written themselves. I can show you one here. Uh, it's maybe a little bit of a supplement on the Google side. I'm going to go ahead and we'll close out of this drawing. And in another, uh, we'll create a new file here just from scratch. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set a projection. So we're going to go ahead and bring up the map tool space here, or my, my workspace. So we'll bring that in. Oops. Make sure I click on the right icon here. So we'll go ahead and turn that on. Once that uh, comes in, we'll go ahead and set a uh, just a quick projection here. So we've got a coordinate system established, and maybe the shape file that I want to bring in is in uh, New Hampshire. Okay. Now, as I look at this, we'll grab the appropriate projection. What I have maybe is some parcels, and uh, Without a Google Earth extension to be able to see, you know, how my data interacts with the planet, um, having a need to still do that, we've got a couple folks that have put together a tool that will allow us to uh, to do that quickly, uh, and just display it within Google Maps just using an Internet Explorer option. So, I'm going to come back to uh, my Display Manager here. We'll connect to some shape data, and the shape data that I'm going to be looking for is going to contain just some uh, some parcels. So we'll come out, grab the uh, parcel data here, we'll go ahead and connect to that, and we'll add it to my map. Actually we'll set my uh, coordinate system here, and we'll go ahead and leave it. If this was the, the data that I'm working with, let's say I was uh, doing some work in this particular area here, and I would like to see how this lines up with the real world or in uh, what we would formally look at in Google Earth. We've got a, a tool that we can load, and I'll show you where you can get this. But we'll say net load. I'm going to come out and grab, I've got a custom tool here called View Google Map. We'll go ahead and open that up, and then I have a tool that I can type in. And uh, as we put it in, uh, with the net load, it'll automatically go into our autocomplete, so we'll select that. We'll pick a point within our map that we would like to view. Another thing on the command line I would point out, instead of just using the first letter of the option you want to use, you see that they're hyperlinks, so we can go ahead and select directly from there. So we'll say point, and I'm going to pick a point within my map. So when we pick, it will automatically fire up Internet Explorer, and it should take us immediately to that location in Google Map. All right. So uh, certainly does not provide all of the functionality we had before, but from a survey perspective, uh, if we just want to do a little reconnaissance, we're doing some work in some area, and I want to see how that interacts with the real world, it provides a nice utility and uh, ability for us to do that. So if you're interested in, uh, in such a tool, if I bring up my Internet Explorer here, and I'm going to go to the Transportation blog, so uh, you can get the address off the top of the screen here. It's autodesk.typepad.com forward slash transportation. We have a division within Autodesk. Uh, we've got a number of folks to blog. This was put together by the folks that deal in our transportation division. They have tools that do uh, do this as well as uh, perhaps some other tools that may interest you depending on what your workflow is. So anyway, just wanted to uh, to show that. Okay, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's start taking a look at some of the survey functionality. So I'm going to close out of this and we'll start a new file here. And I'm going to bring in some data. Now as we grab this data, what I'm going to do is just grab a survey field book. And I'm just going to use a standard one that comes from the tutorial data set. I believe it's called Survey 1. So let's go ahead and close our map task pane here. We'll go into the Civil 3D tool space. I'm going to come down to Survey. I've got a survey database ready to go. Actually, we'll dump it into a new one. We'll go ahead and import survey data. Create a new survey database here, and we'll just call it uh, New Features. Say OK. And we'll go ahead and edit the database settings, and I'm going to set that instead of international feet, just to US feet. This doesn't fall on a particular projection, so we'll just run the data in using US survey feet. It's going to be a field book file. The wizard's going to continue to walk me through. We'll grab survey one. 
which is part of the sample files and the tutorial that comes with Civil 3D. Say next. Um, we'll create a network for that. Let's say this was uh, day one of our data collection. And when we bring that in, we'll show the interactive graphics and we'll show the figure uh, objects as well as the survey points. So we'll click finish and it will see it replay back the data was constructed or the data as it was collected and you'll see that we have some uh, line work created as well as uh, points that were added to our model. Now as we uh, start to look at this, for example, if we hover over some of the uh, the line work, we can see that we've got edge of pavement, style is standard, we've got um, top of curb, that style is standard. All right, we've got another one here that is uh, edge of pavement, it is standard as well. So our figure prefix database, maybe you know we could set that up to do that automatically, but maybe we wanted to start to, to group or change some of these things in mass, and rather than reprocess the data, we would like to start to query and find all of the curb and change that to a different style, or we'd like to reference just part of the data that is available. So if we come over to the tool space, we look at our survey information, we look at figures, there's an awful lot of figures for us to deal with and rather than changing them individually, we're gonna go ahead and use the querying functionality. So I'm gonna go to survey and we're gonna come down to survey query and we're gonna go ahead and construct a new query and we'll call this curb. And let's say our goal is to find all of the figures that are represented by curb and we can change them to a different style. So we'll come down, I'm not gonna do anything with points, so that will stay the same. Figures by query, uh, I've got, well, I've got a couple options here. We could do query, we could say none of them, all of them are by query. So we'll say that we want to uh, grab anybody whose name, we'll say starts with, and we'll say TC for top of curve. And let's go ahead and uh, preview that in the drawing. When we click preview, it automatically gives us a preview state. You'll see that uh, that curb is, is lit up for us. All right, it also gives us an icon on the side to indicate that we're currently in a preview group. That looks good. So I, uh, I can save that or I could display it in an editor such that I could see the panorama display of the, uh, the data that's there. So in this case, uh, let's go ahead, we'll save the query as well as we'll display it in the editor. And if we look in the editor, we see that all of my curb is currently set to style standard. So I'm going to come in and we'll hit control A, which will grab everybody. We will go to the style. I can right click on that, say edit, and we will set the style to be curb. It will update all of those. We'll save the changes to the database. I will close out. And if we drop out of the display, we'll now see that our curb has been switched to the curb style. All right, so a number of things we can uh, do with that. We can also use this tool perhaps for some QA, QC. Uh, maybe some of the data that we collect in the project are buildings and we expect those buildings to be closed. All right, if they're not closed, then maybe it wasn't collected properly or there's something else that needs to be addressed. So maybe uh, for our buildings, we'll take a look at the building lines here. We see they start with BLDG. Let's make a new query for buildings. And figures will say by query, I want to find anybody whose name starts with BLDG. Now let me throw that in capital letters. And let's say who closed is equal to false. So I want to find all buildings that aren't closed. We'll go ahead and uh, preview that in the drawing. It immediately takes us to that location and we can see this highlighted in blue this building is not closed and we can see there's a situation down here where that is blue that's not closed as well I can then come back and you know decide what changes as a result of my QA QC I need to make to correct my data all right I'm gonna go ahead and save that query as well let's uh, just for the sake of doing one with points here let's address uh, points maybe by the lot corners if I hover over this point we can see the uh, description on that point is GBF, all right, is representing my, uh, my lot corners as I look around. All right, so we'll go ahead and let's say we want to find everything that is points for lot corners. We'll create a new entry here for lot corners. 
we'll do points by query whose description uh, we'll say contains and we'll say GBF and we'll save that query. Okay, so we've got that set too. So with that uh, query saved, we've got a uh, lot corners up here. A couple things I'd like to uh, show you. We'll eliminate the preview from before. All right, one of the things in our legacy application land desktop is we had the ability to add and remove points from a file. We can now do that through this querying. So for example, if the points around the outside or my parcel uh, lot corners were not necessary. I could set that query. I could come up and I could say that I would like to remove those from the drawing. And when we click, we see those points are automatically removed. They're not deleted. They come from the survey database. So we've just removed their representation. If we'd like to bring them back in, we can go to lot corners and we can click insert uh, points to drawing and those points come right back. All right. So once again, another um, tool or a series of tools that we can get fairly sophisticated with our data. We can use it for display, we can use it for editing, we can use it for QA, QC, a very powerful addition to the survey database and survey functionality. All right. Now, uh, a couple other things. We can use our survey data to perhaps have a little more of a dynamic relationship with our uh, surfaces. So for example, if I want to build my surface from specific survey data, I could perhaps use my survey queries to control exactly what data is going to be used to build that surface and then also maintain more of a dynamic relationship with that surface. So for example, let's say that we're going to grab uh, my curb shots as well as my lot shots. We'll leave the buildings out for now just as an example. We'll say add to surface and we're going to add this to a, uh, to a new surface. So we'll create a new one and we'll just call this uh, sample and we'll say uh, one in five background will be good for our display and we'll just include two pieces of data that we have right now we'll say our lot corners and our curve. Now I've got two options insert the query results into the drawing as point groups and figures or reference the survey database for dynamic query results. Well if we do it in the drawing it's going to um, insert that data, build the surface from it, and we'll have a surface representing that data. If we do it from what's in the database, then if our queries update, the surface will update as well. So in this case, I'm going to do it directly from the survey database. We'll say OK. My surface is constructed, and you see it includes the points from our curb, as well as our lots, but does not include uh, any of the other data for uh, backs of curbs or the buildings. So let's go ahead and update our lot query. If we look at the elevation, perhaps at a uh, point out here, we can see that that's 247. Uh, as we move in this direction, we're going uphill, that's 250. Kind of the same representation, this is lower than that. So let's say with our lot corners, I'm going to edit that query now, such that it is points that contain GBF and whose elevation is greater than, and we'll say 250. Okay, so anything higher than 250 it will use, anything lower than 250 it will not. So we'll uh, go ahead and save that. If I display it in my editor now, I can see that only those things that have an elevation greater than 250 are now being displayed. So we'll save that, close out of here. My uh, surface did not update because uh, rebuild automatic in that is not uh, currently set. If we come back to Prospector, we look at my surfaces and we look at my sample, we see that it's currently out of date based on its definition and its definition includes my uh, point query. So what I'm going to do is we will select my surface, rebuild it, and when it's rebuilt you now see that as a result of changing survey data, not points or figures within the drawing, changes to my survey data, my information automatically updates. So instead of having to update survey data, bring in, update the point groups, rebuild the surface, we can now tie it directly to our, uh, our survey database. So fantastic, uh, fantastic tool gives us the ability to do that. Uh, last thing we'll uh, take a quick look at here is uh, some of the annotation. If I would like to annotate figures within my survey, Instead of having to convert things to parcels, I now have the ability that I can apply annotation directly to the survey figures. So I've got the survey ribbon displayed. I'm going to go ahead and add labels. We'll say multiple segments. 
and I can select my survey figure and I can get annotation consistent with what I would get uh, for parcels. So I don't need to build a parcel to show annotation. The other thing that I, I have that is a, uh, a very nice tool is I have the ability to create a annotation using points rather than just always having to have a line segment. So I'm going to drop out of that. We'll switch over to the annotate tab. We're going to go to add labels and we're going to come down and under line and curve you will see at the bottom I wish it said add dimension or add label between two points but it says add line between two point label but basically this allows us to do what a lot of folks that have LAN desktop have requested for a while historically in LAN we've been able to add annotation I want to annotate between here and here without physically having an object and now in Civil 3D 2013 it is supported so I'm going to select that let's say that I wanted an annotation from the uh, corner of the building perpendicular back to the property line so my start point will be perhaps the end of here and we'll say perpendicular back to the property line and I get a bearing and a, a distance alright I could set my style to if I just wanted a distance or how it's displayed we can control that completely the point that I want to make is just that now we have the ability to do that so if you want to create uh, use that as your concept for spanning labels or wherever that applies in your particular situation that's now available if we uh, select this annotation uh, we see that a, a line is actually created but the line is not displayed which gives us the ability that we can make changes perhaps and uh, get a distance to the corner over there and our annotation is displayed between the two points all right when I mean two points two points on the screen not necessarily two Kogo points all right so lots of uh, very nice uh, things on the survey side going to make life easier for not only the surveyor but those folks who work with the surveyor and those people who have to uh, deal with survey data so let's take a look at the next bucket here we're going to start to look at some of the transportation improvements we'll switch gears I'm going to close out of this file and let's create a new one and what I want to do uh, once we're in the file here what I want to do is I want to bring in some uh, point data and we'll build a surface and we'll start by taking a look at some of the improvements that have been made to our surface creation so I'm gonna start by um, inserting some points from a file all right we'll just do an ASCII file here we won't necessarily leverage the survey database just for this so we'll go out and select maybe data that was created or collected on several days so we'll say survey one day one through four we'll go ahead and open that civil 3d will kind of interrogate the files and then weed out as much as is possible based on what it can find uh, those point files that are consistent or would match that particular data now in this case um, my descriptions are um, numeric so as a result it uh, and they're common limited so it's weeded everything down it would have weeded it down further if they were uh, ASCII but uh, in this case the majority of them are, are numeric so it took its best stab we're going to come down point number northern easting elevation description common limited I can uh, add that to a, a group and we'll call that group uh, topo to build our surface we'll say okay and when it comes in I'm going to zoom extents there is my point data all right so from that let's go ahead and uh, build a quick surface we'll come up to home surface we'll go ahead and create we're gonna create our surface we'll just call it existing ground so EG contours will do one and five background and the data that we're going to add we'll say modify our surface the data that I'm going to add is going to be my point group that we just created and we'll say topo we'll click OK my surface is created now historically by selecting the surface object and going into the object viewer we can start to look for things that are problematic in this case I'm interpolating to a point out here and perhaps to a zero elevation that I would like to address um, correct those things so we can do that by selecting the surface and if we come up into the surface properties we'll go to definition and I would point out the area for build this is where we could eliminate those points maybe if that are too low in this case it was a zero so we'll say exclude any elevations that are less than one and the other one that we have historically used is uh, maximum triangle length I'm going to set that to yes 
and we'll say that any triangulation greater than 250 feet, we'd like to clean that up as well. So we'll say OK. We'll allow it to rebuild the surface, and that makes the corrections. Now, um, that doesn't fix everything. We may still have some issues around the outside as it relates to perhaps the, uh, the boundary. So we go ahead and we'll select the surface. Let's turn on the triangles so we can see exactly what's happening around the outside. So I'll turn on the triangles, maybe set it to a uh, darker brown color here, make it a little easier to see. We'll say OK. And you start to see around the outside of our, our surface triangulation out here that just isn't good. I mean, it's triangulating from a point way over here down to this side, and it, it should probably work its way from point to point. All right, well, if we have, could apply some logic that said, you know what, if we had an angle larger than a particular amount, that would probably start to find and perhaps uh, isolate those triangles that we would not need around the outside edge. And we can do that now in Civil 3D, and this, this may occur all over around the outside. You may have places that uh, are interpolating along a, uh, a long distance that it shouldn't be. So as an example, we'll look at this. We'll highlight the surface. Same place that we went before. If we look in the build operation now, we're going to come down and you see there's a thing here that says use maximum angle. That gets into that angle that we were talking about in here. So I'm going to say use maximum angle, yes. We'll set that distance perhaps to, uh, let's say, 150 degrees. We'll say OK. It's going to rebuild my surface. And you notice now it has cleaned up the edge for me. So what it will do is it will remove anything that meets that criteria. Then it will evaluate the edge again. And it will continue to evaluate it until it reaches a point that uh, it, uh, the criteria is uh, works and then it stops. So in, in many cases, just using that one tool, we'll go around and clean up the entire outer edge or outer boundary of our surface model. All right, so very, very uh, powerful tool. Helps us out uh, quite a bit in our construction of our surface geometry. So uh, let's do this. We'll continue to move forward here, start to look at some of the other enhancements. I'm going to um, maybe shut my triangles off here. Not going to need those, probably not going to need the border around the outside. And maybe let's uh, go into my layers here and we'll drop uh, my points. We don't necessarily need to see those on the screen. And we'll start to look at some of the improvements to the transportation side. So we're going to drop the node and come down. That should be good. We'll do that, do a regen, should uh, drop out everything else. And my styles may be set for text, so we'll drop out one more layer here. We'll come in V node text, and we'll drop that out. All right, so my points are uh, not displayed on the screen. Cleans that up a little bit. Let's uh, go ahead and just make a quick alignment that we can work with here. If this is something you've uh, dealt with before. All right, we'll uh, just uh, run this in so that we're not creating it from uh, just geometry that you've not seen how it works. So we'll call this maybe Main Street. And uh, design criteria, we won't worry about the criteria-based design for right now. We'll just leave it the way that it is. I'm going to set my curves and spirals to a default radius of maybe 300. And let's put our alignment in. So I'm going to start up here. We'll come over, come around, down, and then maybe to the corner. All right, so my alignment has been created. Next thing I'm going to do is with my alignment created, let's go ahead and create a profile for that for our design. I'm going to select the alignment using my launch pad. I'm going to go ahead and build a surface profile where we can intersect my horizontal and my vertical. We'll add that to my list. Create a profile view for that. I'm going to set my display perhaps to full grid. A lot of other options. We won't worry about that for right now. We'll just display it to see the existing. And if I pick on the screen here, there is a representation of my existing profile. The next thing that we were going to do is if we're going to build a corridor model, we would have a proposed profile. So I'm going to grab the profile view. We will go ahead and using the launch pad, use the profile creation tools. This will be uh, proposed for my main street. We'll say OK. And We'll do something similar here. Curve settings, maybe 200 for sags and summits. And then we'll just lay out a quick design here. So we'll say from 
the end of this guy will come up, will drop down, and come all the way down to the all the way down to the end. Okay, we'll complete that. Our uh, our quick design is done, so we're ready to go with uh, with that. Okay, from here, the next place that we would go is create our assembly. Okay, so from our assembly, we can start to build what our roadway is going to be. So let's take a look at some of the improvements that we have in the software here. What I'm going to do is we'll go ahead and select the uh, tool palettes, which will bring up the content that is available to us. And we'll just do something simple here. First thing that I'm going to do is we'll create an assembly to start with. So we'll say create assembly. Uh, we'll call it Main Street. Uh, basic all codes will be fine. We'll just accept the defaults in case you want to try and walk through something like this on your own. There is my uh, assembly. Now from here I can come over with my content that has provi been provided to me already as part of Civil 3D's install and I can start grabbing components and then snapping them together to make my roadway. Now if I look at a particular component what makes these special is if I were to look at a uh, curb and gutter and we would come down and look at help it will give me some information about the curb and gutter and that it's um, more of a parametric type of a setting that I can control various aspects of the curb. I can um, apply a gutter width, curb width, a height, depth, all right, all of the different components or sub-assemblies that exist within the software. It's not just one curb and then another curb for 24 inch gutter or another curb. We've got a kind of a parametric layout that we can change the values and have it update automatically. Now, this gets back to what we talked about before. If I'd like to create some of my own content and control you know, what parameters are um, you know, maximum parameters we can use and how the values should be applied and define various points along the object for creating figures or whatever the case may be, uh, in the past that would have required writing code. Now, through the subassembly composer tool, and we won't create one right now, but just to show you where it is, we'll come down and we'll take a look at uh, Autodesk, and if we look underneath, we have Subassembly Composer for 2013. If I were to launch that, we'll see a tool come up, and through this tool or through this utility, it's a, a graphical interface such that you can create your own content. Okay, so you can come in if you need to make a special retaining wall and you want it to have parameters that control height that can be passed to it by elevations within the model or if it uh, is conditional. I want you to do this unless you can't find, uh, won't match into existing at a particular distance, then I want you to do something else. So you now have a graphical interface to create content to supplement what, uh, what ships with the software. All right. So I want you to make you aware of that in case you, uh, you didn't know that that was there. Once again, it was an extension that was available in 2012. Uh, it's now ships with the software in 2013. If I want to start adding some data to the assembly here, let's take a look at this. We'll just do something simple. I'm going to grab a basic lane transition and watch as I bring this in. I'm going to pick on the right side of the assembly and you see it automatically creates the right. I'm going to come over and pick on this side and it automatically creates the left. All right, so fantastic in that I don't need to say this goes right, this goes left. It knows where you pick. So if I want to add a curb, I'm going to come in and add a curb to this side. We'll pan over, we'll take and drop a curb on the other side and we're ready to go. All right, and we can continue to, uh, to work our way across as we, uh, as we put these things in. Now, what can be challenging with some of the data that we put in, perhaps uh, as we, we continue, maybe I want to add a sidewalk behind that, is the naming. Uh, as we name our components in a corridor model, it's going to be a generic name. So as an example, if we come in and I select this and we look at subassembly properties, we see that it's a basic lane uh, transition is what's there. So, you know, it would help if it told us if it was right or if it was left or we had a little more control over that. The workflow that we have used historically is to put these things in and then come back and perhaps rename them later. Well, I'd maybe like to add some of that intelligence to it as I go through, and now we can in 2013. So I'm going to come up to settings here, and we're going to come down to my sub-assemblies, and we're going to go to commands, 
and I've got create uh, create subassembly and we're going to edit my command settings now some things I want you to take a look at we've got subassembly name templates all right so by default this is how it's building the name what it is plus a counter I'm gonna go ahead and uh, select that and we can edit it such that I could put maybe the side that it's on and insert that into the list so from now on when I create uh, an assembly or a subassembly it's automatically going to be labeled right basic lane width or left basic lane transition or left curb or right curb all right so in to some extent I think we were able to do that before but let me show you this how we can even extend it further so first it's going to help us with the naming so we know what's on the right what's on the left next if we come to the uh, options here I'm going to come down and we can say subassembly name I'm going to use my uh, name template which is what I have here so we'll come down and say use the name template and then subassembly name prompt I'm going to turn that on all right and you'll see what the difference is here we'll go ahead and click on OK let's say we want to add a sidewalk to here so I'm going to come back we'll add a sidewalk on this side and when we pick notice it puts the right in it automatically gives it the name but it gives us the ability to change it all right so I can call this you know right concrete walk you know whatever whatever makes sense you know whatever you know whatever I want it I mean now I can name it as I do it where it makes the most sense for me we'll go ahead and I'll select this guy here that's the left won't worry about renaming that one at this point just know that you can and we'll set it up to match back into existing both on the left side and then also on the right side okay so very very user friendly now once uh, once my assembly has been put in uh, changes to the assembly haven't always been you know the most intuitive you know we're tempted to start using AutoCAD to move these things around and that's probably uh, probably not the best way to go so what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at I'd like to remove something or I'd like to insert maybe I'd like to insert another uh, another lane so we're gonna come up we're gonna go to basic lane you see there is an option here when we go to put it in it says select marker point or insert replace or detach or detached we got something off to the side I'm gonna say insert select the subassembly insert after or before let's say after this one it adds a new lane to it automatically puts it in shifts everything out accordingly all right much nicer to take and add things let's say that I want to replace something I don't want a um, a curb and gutter but maybe just a barrier curb so I'm gonna select a basic curb here let's say replace I'm gonna select the component I'd like to replace and when I select that gives it the name it updates for me if I'd like to remove something you know what I really don't need that extra lane of pavement I just put that in as, a, as an example I'm going to erase it and if I pull it out everything updates as a result of that okay so uh, far more intuitive than what we would have been dealing before a lot easier to build uh, more uh, robust or complex assemblies without having to rely on specific tools to uh, you know to work with the geometry it's a lot easier to uh, uh, for us to sit down and do this okay now next thing that I want to work with some other new tools here I want to go ahead and build my corridor model well if I come up to corridor you see there's only one option now there's not a simple corridor and like the advanced corridor so we'll, we'll just click the one button this will be our corridor we'll just I'll call it uh, Main Street uh, model uh, says my alignment here is my profile will be proposed the assembly that I will select will be my Main Street and my target surface I'll match back into existing all right so instead of picking those things manually or off the screen like we would have before we can fill it out in the uh, nice dialog if I don't have a need to go in and be changing things with the baseline or the regions I can uncheck that and simply by clicking OK I've got a corridor model so we'll come over and I can display that on the screen okay so now that we've had a, just a quick brief look at our model here let's start to examine a little bit about what's been created I'm going to free up some screen real estate there by closing my palette here with my tools and let's go ahead and expand this uh, let's take a look at 
maybe section display. I'm going to select my corridor. We'll come up to the uh, section editor and maybe uh, adjust my viewport configuration such that the top of the screen will be a section view and we'll have a profile on one side, a plan of the other. We'll click OK and then we'll enter the section editor. What Civil 3D will do is display for us the uh, section in the top, basically what we've uh, established, as well as plan and profile. And as we march our way down the section, we will see a line display in both views so we can see where we are as well as what's in our display. Now, one thing that you'll notice as we come in and we start zooming in and out, the uh, graphical representation of the grid will get bigger or smaller so that it doesn't get to be uh, you know, real obtrusive for us on the screen. If we'd like to clean it up altogether, I'm going to go ahead, go into my view edit options, and maybe let's uh, take and shut the grid down for right now just to make it a little bit cleaner. So we've got our, uh, our model and we can start to see as we drive down the street you know, what's happening in a cut situation, what's happening as we get into uh, fill and, and likewise throughout our roadway. Okay, so very nice tool. The fact that the, uh, the grid is, uh, applies a bit of a level of detail as well as we can turn it on and off makes it a little cleaner for us to see as we work through. What maybe also help is for us to be able to view our model more in a 3D representation. So let's, uh, let's take a quick look at that. We're going to look at what's called the drive tool. So I'm going to drop out of my section display. And uh, instead of trying to view everything through the section, we'll, uh, we'll view it more in 3D. So what we'll do is I'm going to grab the corridor model. I'm going to use the drive tool. Now one thing to keep in mind, the drive tool can now not only be used for our corridor model, but I could also drive things like a, a survey figure such that I can maneuver my way around and, uh, and get a view from a three-dimensional or a, a perspective um, projection of my, uh, of my model. So let's go ahead and we'll go to Drive. It's going to ask me to select my feature line. We'll select there at the center of the street. I'm probably grabbing on the alignment. There we go. I'll grab it on the edge. We'll come back and grab it at the center here in a minute. So I'm going to grab Edge of Travel Way. We'll say OK. It's going to flip into the drive view. You'll see that I'm now connected to the uh, the edge. And as I start to uh, play, I can control my speed. I can control my eye height. I want it to be higher or lower. I can control my offset, which way I'm looking you know, along that edge. And then we can press play and we can start to move down the street. Now, one thing that you'll notice is we go from a fill situation to a cut situation. What happens is that uh, the existing kind of looks like it washes out the roadway. And the reason for that is the existing ground, if you remember, encompasses the entire area. So our model is not automatically like cutting out the existing in that location. So, you know, we need to find a way to resolve that to make it a little bit easier to visualize as well as push it to some other tools that would allow us to create visualization without having to worry about finding a way to remove the existing. So let's take a quick look at that. I'm going to close out of the, the drive tool here. I'm going to select my corridor model and we're going to go ahead and go into the corridor properties and what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a surface. So we'll create a surface from the top links at this point. Uh, we'll create uh, the display, we'll say 1 and 5 design for the contours and add that data. I'm then going to come over to boundaries and we'll create a boundary uh, as the corridor extends. So it's going to like shrink wrap around the corridor. That will be the limits of my surface. So we'll, we'll say OK. It's going to rebuild my corridor. I've got now my proposed contours displayed to represent the surface model. All right, now what's, uh, what's nice about that is I can now use that surface as a clipping boundary within my existing surface. So let's do this. We'll uh, drop out of the corridor model. I'm going to come down to home. We'll create a uh, new surface and we'll call this uh, composite. And we'll say 1 and 5 background is fine. Okay, with my composite surface, I'm then going to modify that. So we'll say modify surface. The surface that we're going to uh, modify, we're going to go ahead and 
paste some data into it. So the composite surface is currently empty. So I'm going to paste um, the surface that I'm going to edit is going to be composite. And I'm going to start by pasting into it the existing ground. Okay. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, add data, and we're going to add a boundary. All right, select a surface to add the boundary. We're going to add the boundary to composite. And you'll, uh, we'll call it uh, Main Street. It is going to be a hide boundary. We'll say OK. And we can select an object or use a surface. So in this case, we're going to use the surface that we made for our roadway as being this one. We'll say OK, and it automatically removes that from the existing. So we're going to come back to the prospector here. Let's shut the uh, existing off. So we'll come down to surfaces here. I'm going to set my existing to uh, perhaps no display so that the only thing we have left is the composite in my proposed. So we'll set the existing to no display. That's out. Let's uh, grab the corridor model. Grab my surface here. We'll grab the corridor model. We'll drive down the center. I still have my, I'm grabbing on my alignment here. We'll grab on the edge, edge of travel way. I could shut the alignment off as well to make that easier, but for right now we'll just drive down the edge just for the the sake of, sake of, uh, of time here. Let's go ahead and uh, play. You'll notice as we drive down the street, we no longer have a situation where uh, the road's going to look like it's washed out. It's automatically going to take the surface that was created as part of our corridor model, and it's going to use that to clip out the existing to make our composed, all right, our composite. So the, uh, the great thing about that is if we update our corridor model, it's automatically going to update the um, composite surface such that uh, you know it becomes one one unit you know we start to move the alignment side to side it builds uh, builds a new corridor model it's automatically going to clip itself against our existing all right so it does a very uh, very nice job uh, as we go through and we work on this maybe we'll go back to uh, the uh, beginning we can uh, switch paths so if we switch paths we can go to another spot in the model so I can select and now I'm at the center line of the street we can drive down and look at that as well as I could pause that I could change paths and I could switch over and start looking at something at the uh, the back of curb or a different uh, back of walk or a different place within the model all right if uh, grabbing something is challenging within the model there are tools here that we can select uh, viewports it'll break the screen into two different views such that I can see the drive on the top and what I would like to select on the bottom all right, very, very nice tools to allow us to get to where we need to be such that we can evaluate our design and work our way through. All right, so fantastic tools as it relates to the first part of transportation and our ability to analyze what we've created. I'm going to go ahead and close out of that. We'll, uh, we'll back up a little bit here and we'll take a look at the next part of our transportation component. So for the next part, we're going to take a look at rail design. So. To be able to do rail, there's been some uh, enhancements to some of the objects that already exist in th Civil 3D, those being the alignment. So I'm going to come over and we're going to take a look at settings here. And we're going to come down under uh, alignment. We're going to look at uh, edit feature settings and we're going to take a look at some things here for uh, rail alignment options. We can set it such that we're going to do chord based or if we set it to uh, no, it's going to be curve based. If we set it to yes, it will be chord based. We can control the track width. We can come in and control some of the cant options. Once again, cant is going to be synonymous with super elevation for a um, regular corridor model. And then we can come up and we can start to take a look at the, let's see, default styles, time, degree of curvature is where we would control whether it's a chord or arc length. All right, so some new properties have been added to the alignment for us uh, if we're going to be using rail. The other thing that uh, we'll take a look at is going to be the uh, building the alignment. We're going to set it as a special alignment type so that it knows it's going to be rail. So we'll go ahead and let's create a new one here. So we'll say uh, alignment. 
We're going to create uh, alignment creation tools. We'll call this rail for right now and the type it is going to be a rail alignment. Uh, I am going to set design criteria here and I'm going to set it to uh, 60 miles an hour such that it will start to determine what my curve should be. You'll notice that when I select that the um, area for my uh, information here for my rail design criteria 60 miles an hour if we were to use criteria based design and we start to look we see that we've got rail can't design standards all right so we've got uh, um, purpose-built content specifically for rail such that we can use in the layout so that will uh, that will work out uh, well for me I'm gonna shut off the criteria based now we'll use it for right now because I want to I want it to control my uh, my curves so let's go ahead we'll, uh, we'll say okay and I'm gonna go ahead and do uh, let's see just tangents with no curve I'm gonna start we'll say way up here we're gonna come down to this location and then we'll come all the way down to the bottom and then let's come in and we'll add a spiral to that so we'll say we want to add a spiral curve spiral between those tangents so we'll select our first entity we'll select our second entity and because of our design criteria that we've established specifically 60 miles an hour and the um, table of appropriate uh, design values for that we'll go ahead and start putting those things in so we'll say that uh, this happens to be less than 180 uh, degree of curve or ex accept the value of 1500 foot 1505 foot radius or I could set the degree of curve I'm going to accept the defaults 1505 we'll say spiral length in 107 out 107 and we have my alignments created now uh, I may have some uh, because of the size here I may have some uh, warnings based on distances let's see what it says uh, yeah my design checks um, I'm not going to worry about that I'm sure it has to do with my distances on the outside I'm just using this right now for uh, just as a quick example let's go ahead and uh, maybe go into our alignment properties we won't worry about the uh, design checks piece so we'll come in alignment properties we'll look at our work our way across here for those things that are rail station control it's gonna look the same as what we had before constraint editing uh, tangency that's good lock parameters design we'll say that we're not gonna worry about the design check set and yeah, we will leave tangency so we'll say okay all right so we'll worry about uh, that for the geometrics but we won't worry about it to testing short segments on the outside so there is my uh, my rail center line has been put in and I've got my spiral information um, as per a 60 mile an hour design now from here uh, what I would like to do is I can start looking at adding a uh, assembly to this and we'll build a corridor model consistent with what we did before so let's go ahead and create a uh, profile display for that so I'm going to select like before surface profile so from rail we'll cut through the existing again we'll draw on profile view I'm gonna set that to full grid that'll work fine create profile view we'll drop down here there is my uh, profile for my rail we're then gonna come in and select this we'll go ahead profile creation tools and we'll do some proposed for the rail design profile design criteria if we uh, check that and we use criteria based design you see we've got rail for uh, for that as well in the proposed so there are uh, um, tables that are set up for rail design both for horizontal and vertical we could go in and um, also edit customize those tables as well if there's specific criteria that you need to meet that's outside what would be considered standard data for the design let's go ahead and uh, we'll say okay I'm gonna go ahead and just do uh, tangents and we'll go from perhaps the end of here let's uh, come up and then we'll work our way down to the end alright we're doing railroad so I can't get too crazy with the uh, with the design let's uh, throw in a vertical curve we'll do free vertical curve uh, parabola based uh, or parabola PVI based it's close to this PVI or PVI uh, we'll do 500 feet okay so there is my uh, my proposed design 
All right, what I want to do now is I want to create an assembly for rail. I've got one that I can use already, and this is going to be where the subassembly composer is going to be extremely valuable as we get into uh, additional rail or other content. There's a tool that creates, you know, whatever component or whatever setup you'd like to work with. In my case, I'm going to come down here to uh, bridge. I've got an example of a rail single, so in case you want to try this yourself. Um, actually, let's create an assembly first so we have a place to put it. So this will be my rail line. We're going to drop that there. Rail single. We'll go ahead and select. Okay, and it is the, uh, the complete rail assembly. So we see the uh, rails, we see the uh, the ballast we see how it's going to uh, well we can set it to match back into existing but I'm just gonna work with uh, with this for right now alright so just like before we're gonna go into corridor we'll come down this is going to be my rail model the alignment we're going to use is going to be rail the proposed is going to be proposed that we created for the rail and my assembly that I'm going to use is going to be my rail line and target surface I'm not matching into anything because I didn't have any components uh, that would match in and I'm not going to worry about adjusting any of the baseline or regions we'll say OK and if we come and look our rail corridor model has been created we can select that immediately go into the section editor that we looked at before and we can start to walk our way down the design okay and you'll see that as it works its way across my uh, my line work here to show me where I am in the sections a little bit harder to see because it's uh, it's kind of small in that view but there's the uh, section there as we work our way across we can see us working from a cut and in, uh, into a fill situation all right now uh, I'm going through a large curve we start talking about things like super elevation or cant this is where I can apply that such that uh, you know I can meet the design criteria or the design requirements for creating my rail right now I've not applied cant so it's pretty much flat as it works its way across I'm gonna to wanna to go through and start to apply it so let's go ahead and see how we can apply that after the fact I'm gonna close out of my section editor and let's take a look at I'm gonna grab the alignment and when I select it there's an option here for cant so we're gonna go ahead and calculate edit cant and it'll tell us that we've not had any cant data associated so far we can calculate that now I'll go ahead and calculate it this is where I can control it shows me the track width but I can't edit it um, because it's being pulled from settings that we've applied already I've got my uh, pivot method do I want to pivot around the low side rail um, the high side or the center in this case let's maybe pivot I'll leave it low side for right now uh, as far as attainment I've got you know various values as it relates to uh, rail design that I can set for my equilibrium cant to my maximum allowable cant deficiency uh, I can apply other tables if I've got data for that I'm gonna use just the defaults that have been established already I can have my percent for coming in percent for coming out uh, very similar to what you would have um, or I would say synonymous with what you would have for super elevation so I'm gonna go ahead we'll finish this okay my um, wasn't specified let's go ahead and click OK I'm gonna come back design criteria will select this here is my my table let me go ahead and select that specifically rail can't design standards okay then it populates that we're uh, we're good to go we'll go ahead and finish so can't has been applied now if I want I can edit that or take a look at it in a table so let's view it in the tabular editor the table comes up on the screen and we start to see information about um, what uh, what values have been applied what stationing I've only got one curve so it's giving me information for that if I had multiple curves in my design they would be specified one after the other uh, these values were all taken off the design criteria that was established I could come in here and I could modify these values to be something else with respect to what's applied the length the station I could even come up here and I could clear the entire table and then set the values to whatever I need so if I've got criteria that I can use it will apply it if I've got uh, specific hard values that I, I just know that it has to be this and not necessarily match a, uh, a national standard or design standard, I can set those values specifically as well. All right. Now, a lot of us are graphical folks. Um, in addition to working with uh, a um, table, uh, 
So if I'd like to see some of this graphically, I can come up into Cant. We can say Create Cant View. So we'll create a Cant View. Uh, we'll go ahead and do it from the, uh, the beginning to the end. We'll just use the uh, standard default values. And if I look, here is my display. So I can see my uh, right rail. I can see uh, begin full cant. I can see the stations as far as transitioning in. All right, I can see if we come down here and look, right rail's at zero, center line's at two and a half inches higher, five inches higher. If uh, I select any of these values, we can start to tweak them. All right, so not only are we seeing a graphical display, but we can start to make, uh, make changes to those values. So in this case, I'm, I'm not going to uh, make any adjustments to that. Let's go ahead set my dynamic input so that as I go to change that maybe let's set it to uh, 6 so that I can see it. So we see that just adjusted to 6. We see it update accordingly as well. If you wanted to come in we could grab uh, one of these station values as well. We could make changes to those. All right, Anything that we would do in the uh, tabular editor we could come in here and edit graphically. At the same time once we've edit edited the data graphically if we come down and grab the uh, alignment which is where that data is stored. We can come down and look at the tabular editor and we will see that where we uh, change that value from five, it now reads six. All right, so it applies that across the board. So wherever you're more comfortable, either doing that uh, tabular or graphically, we can do that. Uh, let's go back and take a look at that now in the editor. So I'm gonna select the corridor model and we'll see the cant has been applied. Let's do uh, section editor. And we are at uh, station, let's hop back to station zero. And you'll notice that as we drive down the street, as we start to get into the curve, you will see that it holds one rail and the other rail will start to drop. All right. And I'm working my way across and that guy is still looking flat. All right, let's do this. I made my changes, but did I rebuild my corridor model? Let's set my rail to rebuild automatically. There we go. And let's try that once more. So we'll select this guy, section editor. And we'll start at zero. We'll start working our way down until we get into the curve. There we go. So as we get into the curve, we can see that it's in a uh, full cant, uh, pivoting off one rail. All right, we get to the other side, we'll see that it will pivot back off the uh, left rail and it will work its way back up again. Okay, so uh, the design right now is pivoting off one side. If we would like to change, maybe after the fact, after it's been created, what we can do is if I come back into the alignment, we can select the cant. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, edit it. And now because it's been computed, I can look at how many curves I have. I just have one. I'm going to come down and look at that. I can change the design speed, the criteria that's used for that. I can also come down and change my pivot from the low side. Let's change it to the center. All right, and we'll uh, close out of that. My corridor will update. We'll select the corridor model here. And if we go into the section editor, let's start at uh, zero. And as we work our way down, you will see now it pivots off the center point. Okay, so it's pivoting off of, uh, of this point now. Okay. So, um, a lot of control, a lot of functionality. Once again, this was uh, something that was a limitation for our uh, customers and folks that uh, required uh, the ability to do design on rail type projects. Um, our corridors were, uh, many people use corridors to try and simulate that, but now we have uh, purpose-built tools specifically for rail design. All right, I'm going to uh, drop out of that. Let's take a look at another enhancement here as it relates to earthwork. Let's say I wanted to create earthwork for my roadway, I could, or my rail. I could certainly do that with cross sections as we would normally, but maybe let's take a look at the volumes dashboard that's been added in 2013. I'm going to grab my design here. We'll go into properties and I'm going to create a surface. And we'll do top links again, just like before. Uh, we'll set uh, display to one and five uh, design as far as the contours. We'll add that. 
and I'm going to come to boundaries and we'll do the same thing and create a shrink wrapped boundary around that such that it limits the surface specifically to the area where my corridor is. We'll say OK and my contours have been added. Now in the past if we had two surfaces we could use the volumes tool to, uh, to compute that. Let's come up to analyze. You'll now see we have an options for volume, um, volumes dashboard. I'm going to select that and in the tool, move this out here a little bit, I'm going to create a new entry. This entry is actually going to create a volume surface. We'll call this uh, total. And the style that we'll use to display it, um, I'm going to set it to elevation banding 2D just so that we can get a kind of an idea based on color, how much cut, how much fill. I'm going to compare my existing ground to my rail model. And we'll say OK. All right, and when we do that, it automatically colorizes it on the screen. We can back up. We can see the, uh, the full entry here of what we have. We can also look and see uh, information about the cut fill adjusted as well as a little graph to show me right now that I've got uh, an excess of cut so I've got a lot more material left over. Now if I wanted to maybe drill down a little bit further and start seeing like where the cut and where the fill is I can start to create uh, boundaries kind of like what we would have looked at before with a, a bounded volume. So maybe let's just do something quickly here. We'll create uh, some polylines maybe to represent this area. And we'll come back and do another one here for this area. All right, we're just doing something uh, quick and uh, dirty for this guy. We could obviously have a much more sophisticated uh, location, but just to show you that we can compute it based on a particular area. We'll grab that. All right, so we've got three areas to work with. We'll look at my table. We'll select total and I'm going to create a bounded uh, volume. So we'll select that. Select bounding object. We'll take this one. All right, that'll be number one. And we'll say I want to create this one. It's going to be number two. And we'll create this one. It's going to be number three. Now, uh, obviously, we could come in and we could. Uh, you know, rename these to be something else. If you highlight them on the, in the table, you see they highlight on the screen so you know exactly where you're at. All right, so any earthwork between any two surfaces, you can create these bounded volumes. It retains this information, so if we close the dialog and come back to it, it's, uh, it's still there. So, uh, you know, I can have that information maintained. Uh, it's going to give us, you know, an updated value once we have the first one to show us where we are at various, uh, various points within the model. Now, the, uh, the great part about this is because it's persistent, if we were to make changes to the design, for example, let's come in here and maybe change it uh, such that we're going to have uh, more fill than what we had before because we had an excess of cut. Let's raise that up. My corridor model will update. If I come back to here, it tells me that, hey, all of my data is currently out of date. Let's go ahead and refresh that. It updates all the values for all the different areas. I now see you know, where I am with uh, cut, where I am with fill, and uh, where I am at each one of those three areas. If we'd like to export this data such that it can be displayed, I've got a couple different options. I can generate a cut and fill report, all right, which goes through. In this case, I only had total checked. So let's drop out of that, and maybe uh, we won't do total, but we will do uh, our three subsections. We'll send it to the output. We've got our three areas. Once again, we can name them to what we want, as well as it'll compute a total for us. So a lot cleaner. We don't have to export it out to the old uh, LandXML report generator or anything like that. We can generate it uh, right from here. Or if need be, we can uh, add that value information directly to the, uh, to the drawing. So I could come over, select inside the drawing file, and it would add that value information for me as well. Okay, so for cuts and uh, fills, very, uh, very, very powerful tool. Uh, helps keep track of our, uh, our design in that as we go through. Okay, last uh, big bucket thing we'll uh, take a look at and then uh, wrap up has to do with uh, pressurized pipe. So uh, pressurized pipe, if you are familiar with creating um, 
pipe networks in Civil 3D, that being gravity based, it will be very similar to that. So we're going to start by uh, by taking a look at uh, pipe networks. You can create a uh, well, you can create a pressure pipe network from an industry model. So if you're using some of the industry model tools within MAP and have created a pressure pipe network for water main, you can automatically move that directly into here. Uh, I can also create one directly within Civil 3D. We'll look at that process. But before we do that, we'll look at one other thing here. We've got Set Pressure Network Catalog. So if I select that, you'll see that there are a couple of catalog databases that have been defined. I've got uh, push on, I've got flange, and I've got uh, mechanical. So I can uh, select those. They're in a SQLite database. Uh, we'll go ahead and just go with uh, push on right now. If I come to the tool space here and we look at settings, I'm going to come down under um, pressure pipe, we'll say under the network parts list. I've got one that comes in the default drawing that's called water. I could create uh, obviously my own much the same way that I would in the uh, gravity base. But if we were to edit this, you'll see that uh, I've currently got this set up for ductile iron pipe, uh, 10, 12, 16, and 6. So you've got pipes, we've got fittings, cross elbows and T's, uh, we've got appurtenances. In this case, it'll just be valves. So if I come back to the pipes, if we select a specific pipe and we edit that, You'll see that we can control not only the diameter, we can control the cut length. So if they come in 18 foot segments or 20 foot segments, it will do that, uh, as well as the allowable deflection. And you'll see where that's important in a moment. As we start to lay it out, we can control, you know, as we pick, it'll factor in the deflection of the pipe as we go. So uh, I'm going to just use the parts list that's already been created. So we'll go ahead and go to uh, pipe network here. We're going to say pressure a network creation tools and we'll call this just right now we'll call it uh, water main parts list will be water uh, surface name i'm going to select that as existing ground because that's where i can start to compute my depth in many cases pressure pipe needs to have a certain amount of cover so i'll use a surface uh, alignment i could establish that if it's going to determine you know station offset from an alignment i'm not going to worry about that because i'll build a profile directly from my pressure pipe and then I can also control annotation for right now. I'll just leave those off. We'll go ahead and say OK. It brings up my tools. All right, so you see my uh, surface that has been set for my reference. I don't have an alignment. And here is my parts list. Uh, my cover, let's say my cover needs to be uh, 5 feet. So we'll set that. Size and material, let's say that I'm starting to work with maybe a 12-inch uh, pipe. And I have the ability to put in just pipes or pipes and bends. It's kind of like pipes and pipes and structures, similar to the gravity. Let's just do pipes only. And if I come over here, let's just start putting some of this in. We'll pick. And when I pick the second segment, I have a compass appearing. It's a little hard to see when it's yellow. We'll switch it to red. All right. See how as I go to pick the next point, it's automatically factoring in the deflection for me. All right. So we'll go ahead. Let's say I'm going to you know, pick a point here, then, uh, you know, we'll pick another point here. And now I need maybe to start to bend or something like that. So we're going to come up and we're going to say, um, let's do uh, pipes and bends. I'll grab off the end of this guy. And now based on the values that are in my fittings for elbows or bends that are available, whether it be uh, 11... 11 and a half or 11 and a quarter, 22 and a half, whatever the case may be, 45, 90. Let's uh, go ahead and pick to come into this direction. All right, you see if I zoom up, it's automatically put a bend in there for me. We'll do the same thing. We'll come down in uh, this direction. Maybe we'll bend over here. And then I can continue working my way down. Okay, so it's automatically added uh, bends for us. If uh, I needed to add a uh, fitting, Maybe a T. Off my 12 inch, I need to have a T that's going to allow me to go uh, 12 inch to 10 inch. So we'll say 12 inch to 10 inch. I'll pick a point that uh, maybe right here where I pick, it's going to add my T. Now, once the T has been added, you can select it or our fitting, and you'll see grips appear. I can start to do things like flip it back and forth. I can use the uh, arrows here to uh, slide it up and down the pipe. Uh, I can even grab on the uh, location and I can start to uh, start to move it. 
All right, and you'll see the pipes reappear or whatever with within the deflection. They'll uh, they'll go ahead and update. Uh, there are design checks that if I were to move something outside what is an allowable deflection, that if I ran a design check and looked for that, it would tell me if that was uh, if that was a problem. In this case, we'll back up. We'll just keep it straight for right now, and let's say that I I want to add a pipe coming off that of uh, we made that uh, 10 inches, so we'll add a pipe taken lock on to the end of this guy. We'll pull off in this direction, and there is my uh, extra pipe. Okay, so uh, adding that fairly straightforward, uh, you know, pretty uh, pretty easy to do. Let's say maybe at the end of this, we want to add a uh, gate valve, 10 inch. We'll come down, click on the end, and it will add a gate valve. All right, very easy, very straightforward to uh, to work with. Now, um, I want to start to see this in a profile. All right, so we can start to work with it there. I'm going to close out of the tools. It's going to allow me to create. And let's go ahead and uh, maybe select one of them to bring up the contextual ribbon. And I'm going to create an alignment from the network. So we'll select the alignment, select the first pressure pipe. So we're going to grab this guy. And I'm going to start working my way down. So we'll grab all the, uh, actually, I think we can grab the first one and then the uh, the last one. So I'm going to hit escape. We'll do that one more time. So we'll grab the first one. Alignment from network. Select first pressure pipe, this guy. And then we'll say, uh, let's see if we can grab all the way to the end. There we go. So it works our way all the way across. I'm good with that. It's going to build an alignment uh, from that. We'll call it uh, pressure pipe. That'll be the name. That's fine. Alignment. Uh, that's going to work good. Proposed. I don't necessarily need uh, any labels, and I don't necessarily need to see the uh, alignment. We'll just leave that as, uh, as basic for right now. We'll create a profile and profile view. We'll uh, cut it through the existing ground. We'll draw on profile view. And as I uh, look at this, you can add the pipe network display. There's all the values. I'm going to uncheck this just so that I can show you this here real quick, how we could add those if we needed to, to say another alignment. We'll create profile view. I'm going to back up and we'll, uh, we'll drop this guy maybe right here. And that's kind of in the way, so let's move him up and over to the side. And that's probably not the uh, best display for that, so let's go ahead and do this real quick. Profile view properties, let's switch that maybe to uh, just full grid. And let's change the uh, annotation on my existing ground here. We'll say drop all the labels out. Okay, so now I'm looking at uh, profile of my existing and I'd like to add my pipes to that. Now I'm going to back up. One of the things that uh, you're going to see is the uh, warning symbols. Why? Because it created an alignment in the background and it's probably giving me things like tangency violations. Uh, it's, it's pipe, it's not a center line of a roadway, so um, if there's any you know area that's off with my uh, deflection that's allowable in water main, that's uh, probably what it's giving me a hard time about. I would probably go back to that alignment, maybe shut off the design checks because once again I am using it for water main. But in any event, I'd like to show this in profile. So what I'm going to do is uh, we'll select the pipe, not the alignment. We'll select the pipe, and I'm going to say draw parts in profile. So we'll select that, and we'll go ahead and start grabbing the uh, oops, grab the profile view. I want to show this one, and actually that's just one pipe. Let's show all of them here. So we'll grab this guy. And we'll grab all the uh, all the pipes. We'll grab those. We'll grab these guys. Him. And I won't show these two. We'll leave those out. I'll just show where the T is. And we'll grab him, the fitting, and then that last piece. All right, and I think I grabbed that by guy, but just in case. So we've grabbed those. Let's draw those parts in the profile view. We'll come back. 
I'm going to grab my profile view here. You know, we select it. There is my pressure pipe. Now, a couple things. Uh, when I picked my points and I set my depth at five, that is the points that it measured the surface, all right, to determine the depth. So in some cases I may be deeper, in some cases I may be shallower based on where I am on the surface and where I pick. Now, a couple things we can do. Once we're in this environment, if we select a fitting, so we'll come down here and grab a uh, fitting. If we adjust the, lo the location of a fitting up or down, the, uh, the pipe will update with it. If we just grab the pipe itself and we move the pipe up or down, it is the pipe that moves only, not the fitting. All right. There is also a, uh, there's also a round grip to where we can curve the pipe if we need to pull it up or down. All right, in many cases, we need to show the water main jumping over or going underneath something uh, if it's gravity. So it gives us plenty of tools to do that. Uh, and at the same time, we can also do some work with these to uh, have them follow the profile. So I'm going to go ahead, grab my, uh, my pipes here. Actually, let's grab... So we're going to grab design and we're going to come down and we're going to say modify pressure pipe network. Okay, and what I want to do is let's do edit the network profile layout tools. That's what I'm looking for. Select the network. It's going to be water main. And what can we do in profile? You see that I've got tools that I can set my existing, what my uh, parts list is, bends, fittings, all right, the same type of tools we would have horizontally, we can use to lay out vertically. I'm going to come through and let's say I'm going to use this, I'd like it to follow the surface. So we'll say follow surface, select the uh, first pressure part in the profile, this one, select the, uh, the next one, we'll grab my pipe here, pipe here, we'll grab that fitting, this one, in this case, I believe I have to select them all the way across. I don't know that I can select the last one and have it update. As you look at the pipes in the profile here, uh, obviously we could update the styles synonymous with the uh, gravity, and it would uh, we could have it displayed, whatever makes sense. This is the default style that's currently set. So I'm going to hit Enter. Uh, follow the surface. Enter the depth below the surface. Let's say I want to go to... Uh, uh, four foot, something different than what we have right now, and it automatically updates my network to match that. All right, very, very nice tools. Now, even though I've done this, if I come back into this display, they are still long segments. All right, it's not like it's automatically going to create a gazillion vertices and slow the drawing down, and, and we have to deal with, uh, you know, some of the stuff that would have been uh, challenging for us to deal with trying to represent pressure um, pipe with, uh, with a gravity tool. Last thing I want to look at, you know, we've got other tools here you can play with. Break pipe, we can delete, you know, make changes to it. A um, couple other things I want to do is start to look at some of the uh, some of the design checks. If we were to make a change to say uh, maybe this fitting here, move this up. The whole thing was at four feet. Let's raise that up, and we can select this guy. And we can start to do things like depth check and design check. So if we do depth check, it says uh, select a path along the uh, pressure network and plan or profile view. So I'm going to grab, oops, we'll grab those guys that we want to check. All right. And when I right click and uh, hit enter, the depth of cover that I want to check for, I want to make sure that everything meets my four foot depth. I could also have a maximum, you know, maybe I don't want to have anything deeper than uh, eight feet or something like that. We could check that as well. We'll say okay, and anything that's uh, that's violating that, I've got a uh, I've got a warning symbol. Now, if I come over and look at some of these, uh, I'm at 3.99 instead of four. Remember, it followed the surface, so mathematically, it uh, worked it out. I mean. That one, I'm going to disregard some of these guys because effectively that is four foot. You're close enough. I'm not worried about that, 3.97. But this guy up here, if I were to check, I can see that's 2.81.
All right, at the same time, if I back up, uh, it's also going to start to show me where those warnings are in horizontal. So if I need to know where I am in the, uh, in the model in a plan view, it will show me those same warnings there. And if I make adjustments, I can check again. If we do uh, design checks in the horizontal view, we will have uh, other options that we can check to see if we've got any open areas in the system where pipes don't connect, or we can also verify uh, things like if we've uh, exceeded the maximum deflection. All right, so very, very, uh, very, very nice tools. Uh, once again, purpose built for doing uh, pressurized network. It's, it's a uh, feature that's being deployed into the software now that's uh, soon to be uh, as robust and feature rich as what we have for the storm and sanitary sewer. So with that, those are uh, all the new things I want to take a look at. I'm going to flip back to my PowerPoint here. I guess last thing that I would touch on before I wrap up is if you are a subscription member, please make sure to take advantage of the service that you have available to you. There is the new cloud or the Autodesk 360 that you can start leveraging some of the, not only the cloud-based tools, but you can also start leveraging some of the space that's available to you in the cloud. You have access to the latest software releases as well as some technical support and some flexible licensing. So if you're on subscription, please make sure you're taking advantage of that. If you're not, check into it with your reseller. It's a fantastic feature to have applied to your software. It gives you a number of tools and options that you would not have otherwise. So with that, once again, my name is Jerry Bartle, Civil Technical Specialist with Autodesk. I appreciate your time and attention, and thanks for attending.